Hello you beautiful audience. This is Reddit Stories. And today's topic is. 3 Creepy Stories. Part 44. Story 1. Welcome to the valley. The last thought I had before drifting to sleep was how excited I was to finally be going on a proper road trip. I've driven for a few hours here and there for vacations. I've even taken a decent 10 plus hour trip. But never a true road trip. Me and my wife are driving from the Midwest all the way to sunny California. I've spent some time there in my youth and always wanted to go back. Enjoy the beauty and weirdness of Venice Beach. Eat a Dodger dog at Chavez Ravine. Take a Normie Hollywood Stars double decker bus tour across Beverly Hills. We are going to travel to Norkel too. See the Golden Gate, see that crooked road, and of course, see the house where the Tanners lived. Rest in peace Danny Tanner. No Rain, by Blind Melon started playing on one of the serious 90s channels. Oh wow, I love this song. My wife blurted out. I, of course knew this. And I caught it when it started, she said. This, again, I also knew. She is not superstitious at all, the least superstitious person I have ever known. But she has this one. If no rain, comes on when she's flipping channels, or in the middle of a TV commercial or something, she cannot listen to it. It must start at the beginning or it's bad luck. Hey, we all have our thing, right? Seeing how happy she was, I drifted off. Enjoy your prize hun, I'm going to nod off for a few. She barely acknowledged me, which was fine. I was happy she was happy. My eyelids slowly closed, like the curtains after a successful Broadway show. When I awoke several hours later, I wiped the sleep from my eyes. I always picture that childlike way of making little fists and rubbing your eyes. But I did it the adult way, just full on rubbing my face with an open palm. I thought I was out for hours. It was nearing dusk when I drifted off. I know we were in the area of Missouri or Kansas. Boring, flat land. The pinkish slash red sky was calming. Soothing. When I woke up the sky was cloudless and bright blue. A blue I'd never seen before. I didn't feel like I'd slept though the night. Groggily I took in my surroundings. Still driving. Wife still at the wheel. Oh, my goodness, I adore this song. She said. Blind Melon was on the radio. I I know. I started. How did this song start again, did I just happen to wake up when this song randomly started playing again, hours later? A tiny, uncomfortable pit the size of a walnut appeared in my stomach, just behind my belly button. Things were about to become serious. What time is it? I asked. She side-eyed me, not wanting to take her focus off the road. It's 7 o'clock hun, you were only out for a few minutes. Confused, but chalking it up to the confusion from one of those heavy power naps, I looked out my window to the endless plains. I saw mountains though. Mountains made of metal. No, that can't be right. I can only describe them as shiny. Metallic. Um what year is it? She furrowed her brow and snorted. It's 2025 babe, same year it was when we started this trip only a dozen hours ago. Now I sat rigid. That's not right. We started, this trip three years before, in current year of 2022. I decided not to say anything. I didn't know what to say. That little walnut pit in my stomach grew to a watermelon. She gave me a playful push on my shoulder and continued to sing to Blind Melon. She then looked over at me, giving me a little smile with her tongue out. She's done this particular gesture 1000 s of times during our relationship. Her eyes were piercing blue. The problem was her eyes are hazel. Or were hazel. What happened to your eyes, are you okay? Do you need me to drive? I must have had a panicked expression that I did not intend to portray. She looked instantly worried. 
I'm fine hun, are you okay? Maybe you had too many Slim Jims or something. She laughed and finished singing to her song. The DJ came on. That was 1979's number one hit No Rain, by Blind Melon. What a voice of a generation. Shannon Hoon, still kicking after all these years. We have an exclusive interview with the man who produced so many hits and famously joined the Beatles for a few years, replacing John Lennon who left for, well, you all know the reasons. Stay tuned folks. In the meantime, enjoy this brand new Weezer hit. I think this band is going to be huge. What the fuck is this? Shannon Hoon died from an overdose in 1995. And he certainly never joined the most famous band in the world. We're at our first stop, my wife said, breaking me from my mental panic. Our jeep rumbled to a stop. I saw the black hotel in front of me. What is this? I said. It's where we're going to sleep for our first night on our road trip, silly. Don't pretend you're not excited to finally stay here. I pretend to know where the hell we were and said something to affirm that. This place was horrendous. It was foreboding and smelled like bad cheese. I took our bags out, all the while keeping focus on the front of this castle. It reminded me of the headquarters that Skeletor ruled. The inside was surprisingly nice. Looked like any holiday in across the United States. After a few drinks that we brought, from 2022 I hope, we did some married things, and then decided to order takeout and see what was on the hotel TV. She said she was pretty beat from driving all day and wanted to take a quick nap. I thought that was a great idea. That would give me time to go online and see where the hell I was, or what time I was in. I stood at the elevators, pushing the down button. What looked like a father and daughter trotted from one of the hallways, stopping near me. I turned to acknowledge them with a polite smile and head nod. Being upset doesn't describe what I felt when I really looked at them. They looked like humans, but... Just a bit off. The eyes were too wide. The nose was too small. The ears almost non-existent. When the elevator opened, they entered. I froze. The father held his arm in front of the door to save it for me. I fished for my phone and pretended I had to take a call. I politely gave him that thanks, but I have to go over here, look. He shrugged and the door closed. At that moment I noticed my heart was pumping through my chest. It was only then that that same heart almost broke through my rib cage. I noticed the phone I had in my hand was a 2000 era flip phone, and not even a razor. I looked at it like it was a medieval device. I slowly pulled the antenna out. I opened it and closed it. I studied the drab gray. I stared at the abysmal digital display. What? Year. Is it? I burst through the stairwell and made my way down to the lobby. Our floor was only on the second, so I wasn't totally out of breath. But I did however throw up when I got outside. The only time, mind you, that I've thrown up without being drunk or actually sick. Luckily I've never been a puker. I slowly and cautiously entered our room. With a key card, just like 2022. My wife was thankfully sleeping. I needed to sit down. I was nauseous and my stomach felt like two grizzlies were trying to tear it apart from opposite sides. I decided to step back outside just to make sure my wife gets complete silence for a bit longer. I slumped down in the hallway outside our door. Let's go over what happened. I took a road trip nap. When I woke up, three years had passed. Little things have changed. But they were huge. The blind melon thing. The people I saw whose faces were just slightly off. I had a mother freaking flip phone, and again, not even a razor. As that thought left me, my pocket buzzed. The stupid phone. I flipped it open, feeling a little cool I do admit. It was satisfying to gracefully flip open the first cellular phones to take a phone call. 
even better was slamming them shut after a phone call. You can't hang up, the phone like you used to. Turned out it was a text message. I read it slowly. The blocky characters were from another time. Figuratively and quite literally. Don't go back to room. I can't see how that's a good thing. This isn't even my phone, this isn't my time, what is all this? I froze for what seemed like a lifetime. I had a simple thought, text back. So, I did. I struggled with the old way for a moment, forgetting how we used to text. Ah uh, yes, the world where keyboards were not shrunk down to a 4 inch dimension. If you wanted to text the letter S, in any word, you would have to hit the number 7 key like 24 times. I made it simple, as my mind was already melting down the back of my spine. Who is this? I pecked. Your wife. We. Want. Make. My skin went cold. I think it turned blue. Won't make what? I keyed the door open again, stumbling into the main room. She was gone. The bed was made. This time with a yellow comforter set that looked right out of the Brady Bunch. Okay, now it's panic time. I texted back furiously. I called, which didn't work at all, didn't even get a busy signal or a dial tone. Getting seriously worried and hyperventilating, I dropped my phone. When I went to pick it up, I heard a voice. Hey kid, you okay? Kid. When I finally grabbed my phone I pulled my arm back like I just stuck it into a campfire. My arm was. Small. Like a child's. At that moment I looked up at the voice I heard. I looked up. I wasn't an adult. The old woman that asked if I was okay towered over me. Feeling sick again, I stumbled backward, tripping over my feet over and over again. It was like that meme from the internet, when internet was around, where people just keep falling down an escalator. When I finally gained my footing, I slammed into a newspaper machine. I don't know what else to call it. You used to put quarters in, and you would pull a newsprint thing out that told you the news from last night. The Uncanny Valley Times. May of. No year. Their slogan, bringing you the most trusted news. Just a bit off. What could that may have buzz? Story 2 A 16J3, a tale of the system, and one man who didn't break free. A 16 slash J3 examined the paperwork laid down in front of him. The endless lines of letters and numbers, truly magnificent, he thought, the amount that the written line can comprehend. He recognized the agreement receipt, it was written by his dear colleague A16 slash J32. He had a particularly sloppy way of writing, a way of writing J3 never would never dream of formatting. Although, he did admire his colleague's use of metaphors, J32, abbreviated from A16 slash J32 because this is an interdepartmental relationship, was originally trained to be a member of the Department of Creative Writing and Government Publicity, although he withdrawed his application for the job when the government compressed the department into only government publicity. J3 found that odd, due to the compression, the staff all were paid an increased salary and a medical coupon a month, J3 thought of this as a dream come true, yet he never had the ability to write freestyle, without the assistance of other departments. J32 thought differently about the salary, so, he moved to J3's Department of Data Review, the department's purpose was to rewrite data entries forms and receipts, these were submitted from data entries, and change the fonts and lettering size to the departmental standards. Then, they sent off their work to the Department of Data Analysis, they compared the two pieces of documents, decided which piece was more suitable for the occasion then sent it to the next department, Data Interest, they run the documents through all the latest statistics and information, make changes to the chosen document and send it to Data Exports, Data Exports sends the documents to the head data administration, the big league, everyone's childhood fantasy is to be in one of the desks of the endless halls of the head data administration, 
proof checking all the other departments work. What a dream that would be, but both J3 and J32 left that dream behind many many years ago, just a childhood memory, quite silly. J3 often said, they both decided to focus on their real jobs, what is in their league. Continuing, head data administration submits the unsatisfactory documents, which is the majority of documents, back to data imports, throughout both J3 and J32's work, they have not contributed to a single satisfactory document, which is not as bad as it seems, as nobody else had in their department had either. J3 often dreamed of the day, when he got the letter, with the golden stamp, signed by the head data administration, telling him that he contributed to the government's global support, and his name had a worth, he dreamt about pinning the document above the water distributor, so all his colleagues would be in awe of his meaningful accomplishments. That was all but a dream, the depressing reality is that J3 would never achieve that, he realized that now, he read upon the document the details of the charges, disobedience and general unlikability. He wondered if all the hassle with the black bags and the armed guards was worth it, J3 knew his place, and would follow if asked by a superior. He saw each moment of his life, listed, laid out. Thousands of lines, each moment documented. He scanned through a few, November, 17, 1973. Enrolled in government education program April, 3, 1967. Listened to Mozart for the first time. Supported government's involvement in the ongoing conflict over resources in the Middle East. He read over all his life achievements. Each moment scrutinized and antagonized by the administration, he once found peace in this, that they watched over him constantly, so long after his legacy has been forgotten, somewhere, somehow, his entire existence is written out, in a filing cabinet, that hope was from yesterday. Today, he felt dread, is that all, my life, I've left no impact, no family, no friends, just my endless service to the administration. He thought. For the first time for as long as he can remember he cried, he cried for existence, or his lack of it. The empty office was quiet, the clock, glued to the wall told him that the doomsday was in 30, 30 minutes. He had 30 minutes till his trial and most likely, his execution shortly after. After hearing of the untimely disappearance of his associate J32, he started to fear his own disappearance, maybe J32 didn't actually go on vacation, maybe he sat in this very chair thinking the very same thoughts. But that didn't matter now, A16 slash J3 would forever be a number, a number in a trillion mile long list of numbers, almost identical to him. He will have at last, left an impact on the system, he left a few numbers there, that's all that matters, because the system grows, and the Department of Human Well-Being listens to your every concern. Five minutes, the intercom started streaming the song Brazil he smiled, remembering his dearest memories, the time he completed all forms before anyone else in the office, his birthday party, everyone in the office had suits that weren't grey. It was magical. This song always reminded him, of those good times. He tapped his food, he leant back and smiled, he was never one for emotion, but this was a worthy moment, he started laughing, crying with laughter. Although chained to the table, he tried to dance, he often saw it on TV, he'd never done it himself. He danced till the men in black kicked the door open, they dragged J3 to the chair, he didn't stop singing, he didn't stop laughing. He broke free from the chain, he, no longer part of the system felt free. Nothing cold hold him down, he was as light as a feather, as happy as a bird, then they pulled the switch. Bring in Y16, and bring in the cleanup crew, I've got J3's documents right here. Dear, A16 slash J3 we respect your lifelong service to the great chain of progress, but we are sincerely empathetic that you, a16 slash J3, have disobeyed form CD38, 2.29 slash H4, which you signed at birth, the conformation of your job positions and the terms and conditions. Details follow, 
Dear Mr. J3, you have been charged with disobedience and general unlikability. Please do not refrain arrest, have a nice day Mr. A16 slash J3. Story 3. And sat down beside her. Hello. This is based on a recurring dream of mine that has captured my imagination so much that I had to write it down. Please be kind as I do not write often, nor is it a pursuit of mine. And sat down beside her. By Devora Magel Greenier. My house has many rooms, and I've been inside them all. On the second floor, at the end of the hall, is a room I am afraid of. It is very dark in that room, and he lives within it. I never asked him his name and he never gave it, but I knew it just the same. Jenkilis. I saw the name in my head as fire in Hebrew letters. Gimel. Nun. Kaf. Yud. Lamed. Vav. Samek. I don't know what he was or where he came from, I just knew that he was made of malice and hatred. His body was made of black smoke that billowed like cloth in the wind. He had two massive eyes that glowed orange and a rictus grin of long, plank-like teeth that glowed the same. At first he never spoke, I knew only that he wanted one thing. Death. The room would seemingly stand empty until I arrived in it. Then he would pour from a crack in the ceiling, from under a door, through the floor or through a keyhole and form himself into an amorphous mass that appeared membranous but would all the same was made of pitch black smoke, glowing eyes and teeth pointed unfalteringly towards me. I would want to run. I was terrified of him. Nothing good came of him, his only passions were hatred and death. But I was mesmerized. I couldn't understand what I was feeling. Though I was terrified of him, I still made my way upstairs and walked down the hallway to the room at the end, across from the bathroom, to see him. After a while I came to understand my feelings as, longing, lust, affection. After a while I came to know him a little. Words never passed between us, his words were in my head. Through these conversations I learned but one thing. He desired me, and he wanted to devour me. Somehow I knew this all along, but despite my terror I craved it. I was falling in love with him. Even when he could not be seen, he was there. He went with me wherever I went, and spoke to me. I love you. Please, I want you. Once, in a field in late afternoon, away from the house, I saw a tractor sitting unattended. With no one around I removed my clothing and sat upon the tractor seat and clutched my legs to myself, and rested my cheek against my knees, closed my eyes and dozed, feeling the warmth of the sun on my skin and my breasts against my legs. Then he cooed to me. You are so beautiful. I love you. You are so warm. I want you. I wanted him as well. I knew the time was coming to make my decision, either to refuse him or let him eat me and become one with him forever. It was what we both wanted, but I was so scared. Another day came when I visited him. I left the room and he followed, beneath the floorboards, but something was different this time. Now, between the floorboards a brilliant blue light shone. Through this blue light he moved, a huge mass of black following me wherever I walked to in the house. Was he growing impatient? I pulled back the floorboard to look at him. He was now a massive spider. He floated along this void of blue light without moving his eight legs. His eyes, arranged with two large eyes flanked on each side by three smaller eyes, shone blue as the light around him. And through these eyes I saw others. Others that had fallen in love with him. Others he had cooed to. I saw him enveloping their nude bodies in his black smoke, then they were no more. Their cells, or perhaps even their atoms, torn apart and reformed into his own. Was this his way? Was I nothing more than prey? In my mind I asked him, were there others before me? He replied, yes. The blue, jewel-like eyes sitting atop his carapace, never leaving mine. My heart sank. Still, I felt I understood. If this was his way, 
if his body required those of others to sustain himself, it did not mean that he did not love those others before me. That he did not love me. I asked him, then, do you love me? Truly. He replied, no. Then I understood. His affections and words were nothing more than a lure, an enchantment by which to shatter the defenses of his prey before he could ultimately consume them. Heartbroken and angry, I said, then you shall not have me. He pleaded, this time without the ruse of affection. Still I refused. Yet still he follows, hoping I will change my mind. No longer pleading but watching and waiting. Why, I don't know. He has nothing to offer me in return for my flesh, but still he's there and will always be, in my house with many rooms, on the second floor, behind the door at the end of the hall. This marks the end of the video. If you like my content, consider subscribing as it helps me a lot. See you until next time.